All right, well, thanks for rocking up again today, for those of you who came yesterday, and for those of you who didn't, thanks for coming today. And today what we're going to do is have a bit more of an informal session than yesterday, and we wanted to involve all of the, uh, either both the young children and the teenagers, and even those of you who are adults with parents working through issues. And so what we wanted to do is just uh, be able to talk with you about those kind of things and what we can apply from yesterday, I suppose you could say, in terms of our personal lives and working through emotions. So what I'd like to encourage you to do um, is to just be really open and speak up whatever you, and say whatever you want today. And uh, that's probably what we'll try to do as well. We've got a very open session today, which means we haven't planned anything. And this is going to be something that we wanted to do, just give you the opportunity to work through any issues. Now, the first thing we'd like to do is ask any of the, pers the young persons with us whether they want to come up and talk to us about mum and dad. So that's uh, one of the things we'd like to do. And, and we'll talk about some of the issues then relating to the parents as well and also for the child if that's what you want. Now, what we'll probably have to do is get you to warm up a bit, what do you reckon? Yeah. yeah. Okay, so who, who has some issues that definitely like to raise? But that's shy. Okay, so quite a few of you, right? You want to come up and share one? Um, well... You come up with us here. I've got another microphone here. You can sit on my chair. That's right. And I'll stand. Yeah, you can sit. Mary's beautiful. You can need to sit next to her. Can you tell us your name? Uh, Sol. 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 Um, I have an issue with my dad yeah. because he left when I was about six yeah. and he's never been home for me. Yeah. And how do you feel about that? Um, well, not one. Yeah. It feels like dad doesn't want you. Yeah. No. Yeah. And do you feel like you were to blame for it somehow too? Do you feel like you were to blame for Dad leaving somehow? Or, Not really. But you don't really understand why Dad left. Mm -hmm. So what would you like to do? So, like, <laughs> would you like to uh, get over that emotion so that you can be happy? Yes. Yeah. So have you done some crying about it in the past? Huh? Not really. I don't feel alright with it. Yeah. But it's interesting you're crying now. So that's really cool. <laughs> It's really good. So, um, what do you feel? What do you feel was wrong with it, with that? What do you feel? Um. Well, just. I don't know. Just doesn't show any interest in you. Well, he does, but he doesn't make any effort. Ah, uh, right. Yeah. You're allowed to keep crying. That's okay to cry. Yeah. We, we did we bring we bought tissues today, didn't we? So we left some in the car. That's about it. That's about what you want to talk about? Okay, yeah. well let's uh, see what we can do now. Now does mum want to talk about the issue as well? Thank you, Sol. Yeah. You're very brave. <laughs> yeah, that's very brave, Sol. And do you want to just mention a few things about that as well? What do you feel about that? You can come up here and do that, or use the mic if you want. I don't know really what I'm going to say. I'm shaking about it and I'm touching, connecting to it. Yeah. So. Oh, actually, um, what I've come to understand is for the people who saw me get up several presentations ago, mm -hmm. um, you connected me to the fact that I was afraid of my father. Yeah. And that was a shock to me because. In his later years, he introduced me to spirituality. Yeah. Um, but after I sat down, I remembered an incident when I was a little girl where I, he was a big man and I was picked up and given a belting and it put me when I'm starting to feel that terror again now, which yeah. hasn't completely resolved itself. And I was so terrified that I wet my pants and I was sent to bed. And 
what I've seen since then is how that terror has attracted certain men into my life. Um, the first situation was an abusive one, and then um, I had a daughter to that man, and then I had attracted another man, which was Sol's father, and he was exactly the opposite in that he was in no way threatening to me because he in no way, to use Sol's words, got involved with anything at all. Right. So, so I can see how the So he's sort of almost un unemotional about everything. Yeah, he, he is. And um, I can sort of see how I attracted that into my life because based on that, on that terror. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. So in Sol's case, obviously he's feeling a lot of grief. There's grief inside of you, isn't it? There's sadness there. And you're allowed to cry about it. But do you notice that when you cry, mm -hmm. mummy gets upset? Have you seen that happen before when you cry? Or not? Not really? You don't cry much, yeah. Do you know why you don't cry? Is it because you worry about what mummy will feel? No? Are you worried about what it looks like to others? Yes, sometimes. Yeah, yeah. So, so Sol's really sensitive emotionally. He's beautiful. He's a beautiful person. And, uh, and there is some, there is a dynamic happening between you and him. And it's something that you need to be conscious of more than Sol at the moment. What, what Sol does is shut down his emotions so that you are not stressed and so you don't feel afraid. And it's because he's feeling your fear a lot. Does that make sense? He's feeling how afraid you are. And, uh, and so he's become so sensitive to that that he, that he automatically just shuts down his emotions. And he doesn't even need to think about it, it's just a automatic thing for him. So the key thing for yourself is to actually allow yourself to start dealing with some of these fears with men in particular. It's related to your dad, as you know. And if you can allow yourself to deal with some of those issues, you'll find that Sol will feel more, he'll be okay to just be himself. And this feeling he has with his dad, that dad's unemotional, he'll be able to actually work through that feeling and, and grieve that feeling. But at the moment, he's, he's not able to grieve it easily. Does that make sense? Because I have been connecting with years since that time. Yeah, that's good. Yeah. Yeah. And it's just like, you know, I think at one stage you said you wrote 33 pages and you haven't written 33 pages, but it's like I keep, they keep popping up, like I keep realising new things. Yeah, yeah. So, so, the thing that will help Sol the most is for you to actually work through your fear with me. At the soul level, what's going on, if I could say at the soul level, <laughs> <laughs> what's going on? is that he's feeling your trade with men and really not even knowing that that's what's going on, but he knows it here, right? And so then he's automatically being conciliatory to you so that so that he can somehow alleviate your fear. It's really interesting because I find him so compatible and he's just been a totally trouble-free child. And yeah. I was thinking yesterday, well, I know it's not me, yeah, he's very sensitive, yes. and because of that, he can feel every emotional nuance in what's happening inside of you. And he's learned over the years to, to know where he, he knows your emotion better than you know your own emotion right, at the moment. And and he he's feeling it and not, and automatically doing something to adjust to it. And so that way, for that reason, and it's because one way the soul has been operating up to now is this feeling that if he does that, then he will love it as well. So there's... I connected to that somewhat yesterday as well. Because, it, because the issue with that, obviously, is that he doesn't feel love. So he's looking for love, at least from one of the parents, constantly. And so the, the key thing for you, for you to do is if you can own a lot of that emotion with you towards me that you have there, what will happen is Sol won't feel as drawn into those transactions constantly. He'll still be a gentle man, like he is, but he won't, he won't feel like locked up in his own emotions. And that's how Sol is feeling sometimes like that. So I, I, I can feel that in you. But sometimes you don't feel you can say exactly what you want in your life and exactly how you feel. You're doing pretty good though, eh? He's so beautiful. Yeah. Yeah. 
saying, can you see what, how it relates to yourself, what's going on there? Now, in terms of that, awesome. In terms of that, the octopus, made by Jeremy, and the, the relationship with his father, the way that you can assist that, even though know his father is not showing interest in him, the, the important thing is for him to understand that it's not to do with anything he's done or not done. It's all to do with the dad, his dad's choices you know, and his dad being unemotional and his dad not being connected. But at the moment there's almost this automatic belief in soul that is based around his choices because he's so used to doing exactly what earns love. Soul, soul feeling. Soul, soul feels so sensitive to everyone's emotions that he's automatically doing exactly what he needs to do to earn love from them. And that means the way to stop that from occurring for yourself is to actually own your own emotions so that he doesn't have to feel them and then respond to them. Does that make sense? Yeah, that's really important. So um, I'm still often, since that time, I'm often, I wake up and there's fear inside of me. I'm having trouble getting under it. Under the fear? Yeah. How many of you have noticed that you've got fear inside of you and are really having trouble getting underneath? Yeah, so, so there's quite a lot of you right here in the same way. Remember that fear is a, is a false expectation appearing real to you. So whenever you have trouble with fears, the first thing you need to do is start allowing yourself to acknowledge what they are. So for a lot of people what they do is they live in this constant state of switching from one fear to the next fear to the next fear, but never really acknowledging it. So what I've done with mine first is just made a fear list and wrote down all of my fears. And whenever we have a discussion together too, don't we, when, when you're in trouble with emotion or, or I am, we first look at our fears in terms of what's happening with our fears. So, so then once we've identified the fear, the next thing we do is acknowledge them. So the way you acknowledge them is to, is to tell yourself, the reason why I'm doing this is because I'm afraid. So whatever the situation is, um, exam an example is, I might automatically try to do what a woman, this is my life I'm talking about, I've automatically in the past tried to do exactly what a woman wanted me to do as far as I was able uh, because I was afraid of their angry projections. Because every time there's a projection of anger, I felt that as you know, no love, so I was afraid of that. So I had to write that down as a fear. And so then what I would do is notice every time I was interacting with a person, uh, a woman, if, if I was, I would ask myself, am I doing this out of love or am I doing this out of fear? Uh, the second thing to do though is allow yourself to actually drop and actually feel the fear itself physically. So you know when a child feels fear, it starts shaking, and you, you've seen that, you've seen an animal feel fear as well? Like if, you, if a dog's being punished, for example, it will often, if it, particularly if it's a pup, it will get into this really strong fear state, right? And what it will do is it will start shaking and trembling and everything inside. And what often happens is that we feel that emotion inside of us, but we don't allow the physical expression of the emotion itself. So, the second, so once you've actually acknowledged your fears, allow yourself, allow your body to start responding to the fear as it feels inside. Because what, if you don't allow that, then the fear will remain inside. Now, once you start doing that, whatever is under the fear will also start being touched on. I think Karen had a, a good experience of actually doing this recently, didn't you? Waking up in the night mm. and feeling quite afraid and mm -hmm. you took yourself away. And Do you want to talk about it? Or? Sure. Thanks, Karen. Thanks, Mary. <laughs> um, I've learned that, well, I, I have trouble sleeping. That's a pattern. Uh, I don't want to sleep, so um, a few times in the night I, I could feel this energy building and I couldn't sleep and it was very uncomfortable, so my method now is I grab my pillow and a blanket and go to the kitchen, curl up on the floor so I don't disturb Spain, and uh, just let it happen, whatever's bubbling up in me. And the other night it happened, I did that, 
And I found that if I keep the lights out, that's very helpful. Uh, don't eat anything, don't do anything, just get and stay in the dark, stay curled up. And um, let, let the tears come. But, and usually I don't know what's going to happen. I don't know what's happening, I just feel like crying. And so I just let it cry and let it flow as it does. And, and then I usually think, well, want to identify, I get into wanting to identify what's happening. Where did that come from? Why did that happen? And sometimes something comes to me, sometimes it doesn't. And I just let it keep going. But the other night, uh, I actually got in touch with that a really deep core fear that I, my belief is it came during the womb. And I remember when you worked with me one-on-one -on -one ages ago because you said I was swimming in grief. And you said underneath that was a terror. Well, that's, I got in touch with that the other night. And when I was born, everything was normal, but my mother said I cried nonstop for nine months. And she held me constantly. She held me and nursed me all day long. And then I suddenly stopped. And I believe it was because my mother was in fear during her pregnancy. I talked to her about it. She said she was a young mom with a toddler, a mentally ill husband, and she was pregnant. She didn't know where the next meal was coming from. So she was in a lot of fear. And I just think I picked up that plus a zillion other things. So, so the way you went, went through the other life is you, you allowed yourself to experience it. So when you experienced it, by the time you'd finished experiencing it, did you feel sort I of the calmness? Oh, I felt peace better. Yeah. But also, uh, as, I, as I was starting to get into the... I was in sadness first, yeah. I think. Yeah. Then I went into the fear, the terror, and I thought, oh, why am I crying? I'm still crying, but I'm feeling this terror. Yeah. And I thought, well, well a baby, that's all a baby can do, really. Yeah. Just cry once it comes out. And I thought, well, what, if I was in terror in the womb, what would I be doing? I thought, well, I'd probably be contracting. Be contracting and... Uh, and can I ask you, though, why you were thinking so much? Because I'm mental. <laughs> <laughs> really mental. Yeah, so... So I grew up that way. It would actually be more powerful if you could just stay in the feeling without trying to work out what it's about. Okay. Yeah, that would be... So it's not helpful to, to identify? You don't need to identify. No. Just it, Because remember, this is all about releasing the emotion. Yes. So as long as there's a feeling of calmness that comes afterwards, then you release something. Yep. And that's all that you really need to worry about. You don't need to know what it's about. Mm -hmm. yeah. I felt calmness. Yep. And I felt as complete as I could get. And so I went back to bed and fell asleep. So you fell asleep straight away? Yeah. So, and you've been having lots of trouble sleeping. Oh yeah. yeah. So now I think, okay, if I'm getting those feelings, go go to the kitchen and clear something. Yeah. And then go back to bed. Good on you. Yeah. Now one of the other things, obviously, the reason why you're separating yourself from Sven and going into the kitchen, there is a very good reason for that, and that is when we're with another person and we have terror inside of ourselves, just being with another person actually gets us out of the terror. Mm. If that person, particularly if that person as it wants to calm us, which obviously mm -hmm. Sven, you've probably done quite a lot mm -hmm. in your life with, uh, with your partner. Mm -hmm. So, so the, the important thing there is that when you withdrew there, that allows you to just feel the emotion without actually having that uh, as a, to be considered as part of the right. transaction. So you can actually get into that childhood state. Absolutely. Yeah. And I, I, you know, in the past when I couldn't sleep, either Sven would give me a, 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 a treatment and that would help me sleep. Or I'd get up and I'd read, or I'd eat, or both, yep. or do something yep. until I was exhausted when I go to bed. Yeah. But this is much better because yeah. I know the reason for it. Yeah. So you're releasing some of that causal emotion, and each time you do now, I think you'll find that you'll probably have a good sleep. Yeah, practice. it's going to get better. Yeah. yeah. That's good. That's awesome. So getting back to the issue with fear. Uh, the important thing, obviously, is to allow yourself to do what a child would do. Allow yourself to do that 
that process of actually going into that childlike state of fear because it's the childlike state of fear that will help you connect with the fear itself and release it. It's, it's certainly about your relationship with your dad um, and, and with men since then and uh, what you've attracted. But if you allow yourself to connect to it, what that will do is you'll be owning your fear then. It won't be, be, be projected and that will mean that it's a lot easier for soul to actually just feel his own emotions all the time rather than feel some of yours that want to try and make it better for you. So soul will actually find himself at some point, maybe, maybe feeling a bit upset and angry with you at times right, during this process. And the reason why is because when we've done so much for somebody else and then, um, and then the person doesn't need that happening anymore, we start worrying in ourselves whether our whether uh, you know we're not going to be loved anymore and things like that, so that there'll be there'll be uh, some some feelings that you will probably go through, and the key is to allow them to allow yourself to go through. Yeah. Thanks, all for being great. Anyone else would like to come up and talk about some stuff? By the way, everyone that comes up is going to get a, a star. Oh, a star. <laughs> so you've been, been a good girl now. <laughs> so you're allowed to have a star. Um, he has been angry with me a lot, but 
uh, over the last six months or so, he's been better. But I miss the closeness in yep. our relationship. Yep. Um, and was it around six months ago that you started sort of really dealing with your emotions properly? You well, around that time I said to my younger son, um, we need to stop saying that your brother's always angry. Mm -hmm. I said, because we're holding him energetically in that place. So I stopped thinking that way. Um, and I noticed he doesn't act that way as much. It still comes up. Um, do you understand why he's angry now? Probably lots of reasons. Probably that I, I was so protective of them in many ways and that he felt a lot of my emotion um, as a child and um, no, I don't know, probably about relieving his dad, probably about lots of things. And, and the process of you forgiving that anger actually helps, helps him a lot. So that was great that you did that. The, the next step really is to, like, as you've been doing the last few months in particular, you've been honing your own emotions, so that will help him a lot too. Mm -hmm. as, as you do more and more of that, there's a particular emotion, as you know, about men that needs to be mm -hmm. focused on. Yes. And if you can focus on the emotion about men that you feel, that's going to help him a lot. Because what he feels and has felt most of his life is this really unjust thing from you that he feels like that uh, mum, some, he, he can never define it, but he feels like mum doesn't like men, so therefore mum doesn't like me. But it feels unfair to him, mm -hmm. and that's why he's responded in an angry way. Mm -hmm. And okay. also, you know, so, um, yeah. as well. And he's also always taken a lot of responsibility for women yeah. in his life over. So you lose my brother, it's all about. That's yeah. the main thing. Yeah. You're doing quite well, right? You're doing very well. Yeah. You get a, get a start here. Do so, I? Yeah. 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 You get one even if you're not doing well. No. Oh, no. 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 <laughs> <laughs> You always get a start in harmony with love. <laughs> yeah. Do I get to choose? You yeah. get to choose. There's not much of a choice, but you get to choose. <laughs> I think I'll go with oh, that one doesn't really come up. Maybe it's this one. <laughs> with regard to children that become angry with us, how many of you have had children uh, that are now very angry with you? Yeah? One thing to bear in mind with children that are very angry with you now is that it's due to a long-term problem with you that they've become angry. Maybe if I can liken it this way from an emotional perspective. It's like if myself and Mary are sitting next to one another and I just punch Mary in the arm. And I just punch her in the arm. Now, today she might forgive me for it, right? She might just go, well, what'd you do that for? And we you know, might talk about it or something. But if the next day I come along and just do the same thing, what's that going to do to her? Do you feel What's going to happen there? Sorry? Makes it more personal. She's more confused. She's, she's also now feeling like, oh, I want to harm her, isn't she? And the truth is obviously I do, because I'm, I've punched her a second time. Now, if I came along every day and did the same thing, how many days would it take, do you think, before Mary's angry with me? How many you reckon, Sorry? Two, you reckon. <laughs> Two's about the limit, isn't it? Third day, that'd be it, wouldn't it? You'd be feeling pretty angry. Now, what's happening with our children is they're receiving a constant barrage of our own, own unexpressed emotions. You want to say something? Maybe I want to say Maybe. something. You want to come? She, she doesn't want to say something? She does want to say something? Layla, you want to come down? I've got a microphone here. I'll just go you can sit on the chair here next to Mary. You like that? Yeah. Yeah. Climb up on that. What would you like to say? Well, my dad. We were going down to my mum's house. My, I mean my dad's mum's house. And well, we were going to leave, but he couldn't find 
as well. And then um, we need to go back and my dad decided to stay there. And um, then um, he started to, um, well, say things about my mum that never happened, like my mum stole his wallet, which she didn't do, and things like that. So that, that upset you quite a lot? Yeah. It? So what do you think was happening? What do you feel? What did you feel when that happened? Well, that my dad didn't want my mother. And
So, so although you have said to her that it's not her job to make you happy, the projection of emotion coming from you is, please, somebody make me happy. Please, somebody make me happy. I'm in this terrible place. Please make me happy. And the reason why you're not getting to the core of this emotion is because you still want somebody else to make you happy with it. Does that make sense? Yeah. If you, there's a few things you can do to get out of that state. One is to firstly take this emotion to God rather than feeling like someone else around you needs to make you happy. The second thing is actually feel the terrible emptiness that you feel inside about nobody okay. loving you. But really fully feel it rather than wanting somebody to make you happy from for it. Does that make sense? Because the instant you deny that emotion will be the instant Layla will respond and try to make you happy. So whenever Layla tries to make you happy, instead of telling her Layla, you don't have to make me happy, what you need to be saying to yourself is, I wanted Layla to try to make me happy. Does that make sense? The, the, the feeling in you is that you wanted her to make you happy. Do you follow me? Yeah, I do. Yeah. I, I remember the day, the other day particularly, and I and only say straight away, I love you too. And I just, for the first time, she never say it back. Yeah. And I saw when the father and we were together, she kept saying, I love you, Daddy, and he wouldn't say it, and it broke my heart. And after the first time the other day, I felt the space he must have been at mm. because he couldn't say it, mm. because he didn't feel it in himself, for himself, yes. not for her. Mm. And I reached that point the other day where I couldn't say it back. Yeah. And I, I really hated myself that I put her in this position yeah. of feeling she had to try and make me happy. Yeah. And, and I, I hated myself even more. And that actually gets you out of the core emotion. Gets you out of it. Yeah. What hate yourself more. By, yeah, what you're doing now is you're entering a punishing of self state. And whenever, and this applies to all of our emotional processing, when you enter a punish of self state, you are actually getting out of the core emotion. Well, it was interesting. It was interesting because um, I homeschooled um, mm -hmm. and it was Wednesday, and where I was staying with my friends because they come um, as well, and I was expressing to my friend how bad I felt, and it was it wasn't good. And um, and then all of a sudden I was schooling around, and I can't even remember what was happening, but because my son just got married last weekend, and. It hit me in something I said to my son when he was a child, and he's never forgiven me for it, which is fine. Um, yes. I know he can't. And, um, and it only hit me the other day. I said to him, I can't cope, and I'm going to put you in an orphanage because I can't cope. But the other day I realised that um, it wasn't him that I was hating or not liking, it was the fact that me was putting so much yuck onto him. Yeah. I didn't want him growing up with a horrible mother like me. Yeah. And, um, so there was a lot of, at the core, there was a lot of self-blame and, and self-hatred. Yeah, and I don't know whether it was that that sort of um, changed me. I don't know exactly, but we went to our shipping container the other day, my friend's property, and we went through some photos and um, to send to a dad, and um, it kept hitting me the photos that did something to me the most, and it was all the photos of him and Layla together, mm -hmm. and I actually wrote him a little letter about that, and, and I actually... Can you yeah. see, though, that the reason why the photos of him and Layla together influenced you the most is because of something in your childhood about... Well, I saw the love that was there and he, I, I didn't feel love from him but it was those times that I actually felt the love and I wrote that to him today that I, the other day I thanked him for allowing me to see that love and that my soul would carry that all my life that I couldn't It was so 
and interviews in our relationship, it just wasn't right. And two people don't stay together when there's so much abuse, do they? But it was the only man that I actually connected to. Whether it was the law of attraction, he, uh, codependent thing, or what? But you connected to him. So you, you connected to a man, and he abused you. I abused him as well. Yeah, so I was cruel verbally to him as well. And yeah. I didn't mean to be, but I couldn't cope with drugs and alcohol and, yeah. and trying to raise a child in a spiritual way. And, and yeah. I know he has that in him as well. And through his own stuff, he was in denial. Yeah. And we were just a toxic mess. But can you see how this is relating to your relationship with your father? I, I try to, yeah. and I, I sort of can't get back there, you know? Yeah. My dad wasn't an alcoholic, he wasn't a smoker, he's a workaholic. Yeah. Um, and I know I got hit a lot as a child, and, and I know, you know, I've been looking at it for years. So who did the hitting of you as a child? Who played? Was it mum or dad mostly who hit you when you were a child? Hit me. Yeah. Mostly my dad. My mum could never cope with me, so you wait till your father gets home. And, and then dad got home and the punishment. Yeah, and I got punished. And, um, and uh, I mean... And then the rest of the time he was he worked too much. Yeah, he worked, he worked a lot. And so he was rarely there. Yeah. So what's the feeling you have there? See, what's happening at the moment is you're, you're, you can very easily connect to the trigger, and the trigger is your ex-husband, right? That's the trigger. Mm -hmm. You can easily connect to that situation, but to actually take this to a core, you need to actually even go further than that and see the relationship between what you have with your ex-husband and the relationship of what you actually have with your father. Mm -hmm. And that's the area you don't want to go to. Just I, I sort of hate him. I, I, I hate that he was so angry. And as a child, I remember at this age, even thinking, I'm so sick and tired of having to be so nice to you so you won't crack. Yeah. And and I hate not being me. I hate being somebody else. That, yeah. And I mean, I, I still was a horrible kid. I used to, you know, don't slam the door, so I'd slam the door just for the hell of it. Yeah. You know, and I'd do everything just for the hell of it. Yeah. You know. And that's not. You see, this is where the source of your bad, I'm bad emotions come from as well. The truth is, you aren't bad. <laughs> That's my other <laughs> the truth. No. The truth is, you aren't bad inside. It doesn't matter who I ask. I can ask her or not ask her, it doesn't matter. You are not bad. The source of all of this problem of your self-blame comes from the fact of, firstly, there was this relationship going on with Dad and Mum where, where they projected huge amounts of emotions at you, and then you learned to blame yourself. And now, in fact, one way that you get away from dealing with a core emotion is you blame yourself. Mm -hmm. And that is not helping you actually get to the core emotion, which was this terrible feeling of being unloved by your father in particular. I, I feel it was both of them. Yeah. But it's far, father in particular that's defining the relationships, and it's the thing that's currently affecting later. Mm -hmm. but, but there is a deep resistance in you at the moment to actually touch that emotion. Yeah, I, I, I even tried in here yesterday to, to keep going into it and it's like, and I mean, I've been trying to go deeper and deeper and I've been asking God and praying to God and, and, and any spirit guides. I mean, look, I know things are like peeling off the onion a little bit because I'm 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 I'm, I'm seeing it around and and I was able to speak at my son's wedding last week even when I came that close to not being able to say what I felt and so I felt some but but then I went right down after my son's wedding just really badly and like I said something just came up again this week that I changed for. And I'm just trying to be humble and face the truth. <laughs> and then you're doing well with that. You're doing well with that. 
Ayo. I've got two, I've got three beautiful children and and it dawned on me that I I love them. Having this one, I realise it's a different one. And I kept thinking, why do I feel differently about the others? And it's not them, it's me. And why don't I really love my parents when I should? I beg your pardon. Yeah. Whoa. <laughs> you know, and right now they're in an absolute mess and all of us kids should be there to help them. And we're all running the other way. And, yeah. and like, obviously taken on a lot about your parents, you know, you, you feel you should love them, you should be there for them, so that's a lot of, you know, we were talking yesterday about the expectations in a family not necessarily being loved. I, I actually can't hear a lot. Um, oh, okay. I, yeah. I actually just feel what I think is happening and process it. Yeah. Yeah. But what occurred to me when you were talking, you were saying you, you sort of really feeling blocked to go down into these emotions about your family, about your parents. You can sort of up here feel like, oh, maybe they didn't love me, but can't actually feel it. So it just means that you're blocked. And sometimes it helps me to look at, well, if I do experience that emotion, what other emotion will it trigger in me? So for me, to feel that my parents didn't really love me is really threatening because for all of my life, I found it really hard to see love anywhere else in the world, and I always felt it was there in my family. So to feel that there's no love in my family, then that tell, then I have this whole other feeling, there is no love in the world. So maybe there's something there that's blocked, you know what I mean? Yeah. So maybe there's something there that's blocking you, that if you, you sort of, in you, you know, if you go into that emotion, there's something really deep and dark under there, or maybe it's, this sort of self-hate thing that you feel like if my parents didn't love me, I'm unlovable. And so there's a, there's a real block there to just feeling the grief about the, fam the parental relationship. I, I know that I brought this up the other week up at Ulo and I was so angry because I felt that I was ready to deal with it all and I felt like I, I was stuck in limbo. Yeah. Too, and I do this too, is you get really self-punishing about it. You say, and the same thing with your family, you feel you're responsible and you, you should be loving them and you're ready but you're not doing it so there's something wrong with you. Instead if you can try and be like a parent to yourself, be quite gentle with yourself and say, oh, I don't want to feel it, it must be really huge. Why don't I want to feel it? What does it mean? You know? Because while we beat ourselves up about it, it actually just freezes us up even more. Yeah, I've been trying to do those too, and I, but it's it's obviously a... what you're saying. And like, I, I said to my friend the other day, I said, look, I'm getting these insights and visions of, of a child, and I'm getting the idea that it was this, this, this. But I said maybe there's a something under the core thing. Can, can we just stop you there? Because feel what you feel right now. The feeling that you have right now with regard to your parents that you mentioned was that you feel like you're a bad daughter, right? And you're not looking after your parents. Now that's a really core emotion inside of you that began when your parents were young and you were a child. Does that make sense? So they actually created in you this emotion that of feeling bad every time they need help yeah. and you don't want to give it. They, and you felt bad and sometimes you got angry and sometimes you got sad and sometimes you did what they wanted. And, and so that's a really core emotion in you. This is one of the reasons why you're not allowing yourself to feel your own emotions because you keep blaming yourself. You think, in fact, you, you, like the words that you said were that my parents were good parents but then all of the things you're explaining to us don't sound like they were good parents. Does that make sense? And the key is to actually say the truth. I don't feel my parents were good parents. I feel that my parents 
you know, they hurt me. My father came home and punished me, and I never saw him. And my mother kept on yelling at me during the day, that wait till your dad comes home, and I lived in fear most of my days when I did something wrong, waiting for dad to come home. This is the state of your childhood. Now, whatever the emotions are of the parents, and however good they are now, that was very, very damaging emotionally to you. And you need to allow yourself to acknowledge that. Because at the moment, what's locking up a lot of your emotion is you want to believe that everything is good for everyone else and you're the person to blame. And that's just not true. Yeah, and actually there's a little girl inside of you about Layla's age that is a bit pushed around by this adult you because she just wants to feel sad. She wants to feel really sad about what was happening. But the adult part of you is saying, no, it's all right, no, I'm really I'm bad, and oh, I should have done this, and it's all my fault. I don't know, sometimes I felt so bad in my life, I don't even know what it feels like. No, I, you know, my son got married last week, and he's, something's happened that he's just got this beautiful young, well, this beautiful woman in his life who's given him the freedom and trust that I could never ever achieve. And I thank you so much for that. And, and my daughter and her husband. But I just feel so stuck in myself and I'm just taking up the tree here. No, no, just, if we could just, we will stop for a second. But one thing to keep in mind with all of this is that what's happening in life is that you're blaming yourself and that's the way you get out of how you feel. The way you get out of how you feel, really, inside, right deep down, is you blame yourself. And can I just, this is something that many of us do. What we do to get out of an emotion is we finish up blaming ourselves as if we're the person to blame. And when we do that, when we feel we're the person to blame, it, it helps us get out and skip out of lots and lots of different emotions. So, you, it's used as a technique to avoid causal emotion. So what's happening for yourself a lot is you, as soon as we start on an issue, you immediately go back into blaming yourself. Every single time. So if, oh, there was three or four issues that you brought up today so far, and every time I tried to focus on what the truth is, like mum and dad were to blame for that, you wanted to blame yourself instead. I took, I took the blame for my siblings because I know. They, they couldn't take it. And but this is, as this, much as I got flogged, I said, I'm not going to cry. This is your addiction. This self-blame is an addiction in you. You've become so addicted to it, it now defines you. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. And, and to get to causal emotion, you're going to have to stop blaming yourself and see the truth of what actually would happen. What actually happened was not your fault, but you want it to be your fault so that you do not have to feel the other emotions underneath that. Does that make sense? Yeah. yeah. I don't know how I'm going to do it though, but it makes sense. Well, one way to do this from now on is every time you open your mouth to blame yourself, instead of doing that, Pray to God at that instant. So don't open your mouth to blame yourself. But instead pray to God and say, I know you know, you feel unworthy. Just say those words to God every single time you want to blame yourself. Because God actually feels you're worthy. God, feels, God wants a relationship with you. Right? So God feels you're worthy, just as worthy as I am or any other person is, to receive her love. Now, you don't believe that at the moment, mm -hmm. right? But if you can, so every time you open your mouth to blame yourself, instead of saying, oh, it's because I did this, I did that, I, that, that is your addiction. Recognise the addiction. And recognise the addiction in every one of your relationships. I know it's even felt safe to have the addiction because I know that one. Yes. It's, it's, I, I came to that the other day. It feels good because I know that. It's I'll your safety place. Yeah. Yeah, it's your yeah. safety place. And I know it sounds a bit strange, it might sound strange for some people that to hear that that's your safety yeah. place, but in reality it's the safety place of many people. They are actually addicted to feeling their self-shame because they don't want to feel 
Some other terrible emotions like feeling unloved by anybody, for example, is a worse emotion. It's better if I can just punish myself and say, I'm to blame for nobody loving me. Does that make sense? Mm. You know, I've been through this emotion lots and lots. Oh, I've felt you have. Yeah. So, so I, can, I can understand how much it is to go into that self-blame place and how tempting it is every time. But if you do it, if you do it, what you're doing is you're staying away from the real emotion that's going to help you grow. Right? So you need to at least at some point start recognising this is an addiction in you. You want to blame yourself so that you don't feel the other emotion, whatever the other emotion is. And just, just write that down or whatever, and then ask yourself, what is the other emotion? The other emotion might be, my mum and dad didn't love me. The other emotion might be, I'm unlovable. Right? And that's the emotion that, that you can skip over. You see, if, if you're to blame for not being loved, that's easier for you to bear than just that your mum and dad didn't want to love you. Right? It makes more sense to you if you're to blame for it. Right? But it's actually not true. You're not to blame for it. Can you see where you need to go with that? So have a look at the, as just an addiction you have to blaming yourself. How many of you feel after that discussion that you've got an addiction to blaming yourself? How do you? Oh, I've had that, so it's a pretty common addiction. And the key is to get out of that, because what, that addiction is stopping you from getting into the underneath emotion, which is even worse, like it feels worse. That's why we do the addiction. I'm going to be like I was this week. No, what you would do is when you get in the underlying emotion, you might feel for two hours and you'll come out of it feeling totally different. The problem with the addiction is it keeps you in that place for years and years and years and years and years and then the underlying emotion, which needs to be released, can't get released and so you can never feel different. But when you feel the underlying emotion, it might only take two hours, it might only take a day or two, might not take long at all. Once you release the underlying emotion, the addiction will no longer be needed either. You'll just give up the addictions. And also, the causal emotion will be gone and you'll feel totally different to you than what you felt before. Does that make sense? Yeah. I just wanted to say that um, I found that it's not
um, something about you know, how long are we going you know, to keep going? And I, I asked her, does she, is she okay about it? You know, because I just drag her on because I don't have a babysitter for it. And she said, no, no, it's, it's fine, it's fine, it's okay. And I asked her the other day, was, does she see any difference? Yeah, a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> so, That's good. Well, thank you very, very much. No worries, thank you. <laughs> And I just want to get back to that point about our addictions. We often stay in an addiction emotion, which are often quite painful to stay in, but we use them as a, as a method of getting away from an even deeper and darker emotion within ourselves. So if you notice yourself doing that, start just recognising what you're doing as an addiction. So it's just... It's just the same kind of principle of, where, of an alcoholic going to alcohol or a person who's feeling sad going to alcohol and a person who's feeling like they want to get away from their life to go to drugs. It's the same kind of feeling except we've just instead of, instead of using alcohol, we've used this other emotional addiction. Does that make sense? This other emotional addiction is the addiction to punishing myself, for example. So I might become addicted to punishing myself blame and self-blame because I don't want to feel the underlying emotion which we obviously believe is worse. M mind you, most of the time it's not actually worse. It's actually worse to feel the addiction for the rest of your life than it is to actually get into the underlying emotion. It's a bit like a person who becomes a drug addict. Drug addict. What's worse? The underlying emotion that causes the drug addiction, if he dealt or she dealt with that, it might only take a week or two weeks of their emotional life to deal with that and yet they stay a drug addict for 10 years. So which in the end creates more habit? In the end it's the addictions that often create more habit. Dennis, would you like to... Chris has got a mic back there. Hey Jack, would, would illness be defined in the same way? As an ongoing thing? Staying within the illness? And it can be an addiction. Illness certainly can be an addiction. Um, it depends on what the underlying motive is. For most people, illness is actually the denial of an underlying emotion. So when I'm denying an underlying emotion, usually I will get sick, depending on what that emotion is. But you may actually also be addicted to illness in order to get approval, or in order to get love. And if that's the case, and we find ourselves getting sick over and over and over and over and over again, we need to look a, a lot more closely at how much we feel we're loved. Because it's highly likely that we're actually feeling very unloved and we want, we use illness as a way to get attention. And you know that there are many people that doctors nowadays sometimes call the hypochondriacs. They, they always seem to be sick or they always seem to be worried about some kind of affliction. Well, the, the, creating an illness is an extension of that in, in, in some cases. So it can be a mixture of those two things. Look, whenever I get sick, the first thing I look at is my denials. Yeah. So just, uh, not yesterday, but the day before, I had a very sore throat. And I was saying to Mary, oh, it's looking like a good weekend coming up, like I'll probably get sick over the weekend and maybe have to cancel it or whatever. And, uh, but what I did was I laid down for an hour uh, in the morning on, uh, on Saturday morning, because I still had the sore throat Saturday morning. And I just prayed to God about, all right, what, why, what am I denying within myself here? And it came very rapidly that it was to do with uh, me not wanting to be loved. And, uh, and I was denying uh, some of those emotions that were underneath that. And when I allowed, I, I just allowed myself even just to acknowledge that, my sore throat disappeared within a few minutes after that. So, and that's like, so yesterday I was fine with my throat. Does that make sense? Like it's just a matter of acknowledging sometimes even that this is the real state that you're in. Thanks. Yeah. Any other questions, James? Um, I just um, wait for the mic. Thanks, James. We were talking about this whole program. I had a patient some years ago who um, uh, came to me and told me that she, on the day before, she'd met an old boyfriend and one thing led to another and they were up in bed together. And as she drove home to her husband, her throat got more and more sore every metre of the way. Yeah. And she 
he knew she was going to avoid telling him about Yes, it. yeah. We had a friend uh, recently in England who rang us up and said she got such a bad uh, throat that what actually happened, she had to go to hospital and they diagnosed her with chronic... Uh, Hypothyroidism, I think. Yeah, hypothyroidism. Uh, and she, they told her that she'd have to be on medication for the rest of her life because of this particular problem. While she was in hospital uh, getting these checkups, she went through some pretty big emotions because she actually, they actually at one stage thought she had throat cancer and so she was quite afraid. Then, while she was in the hospital, she realised that it was actually that she had withheld telling her partner some things about an infidelity uh, regarding their relationship. And, and she had a realisation that her, this problem with her throat was totally caused by her not wanting to tell him the truth. So she went straight home and told him the truth. And he had about two weeks of emotional processing to deal with after that, which he did. Um, and because he had actually always thought that what she told him was the truth, and she looked, he'd always accused her of it, but, or, or, sorry, that she had told him before that wasn't the truth. And he, she, he'd always accused her um, of something more going on, um, but she would never tell the truth. And she got, and the reason why he was so upset was because he felt that she had to be threatened with death before she told him the truth, uh, which is probably true. But what happened uh, is two weeks later, the same lady went back to the hospital to get checked, and the so-called thyroid problem didn't exist at all. Uh, and they said to her. Uh, the doctor said to her, we don't understand, we, we double checked all the tests the last time you were here, you definitely had this problem, we don't understand what's going on, we must have, there must be something wrong with the instruments. And, you know, so they went down the track of you know, uh, justifying it through that method. But the truth is that within a few weeks she created this illness just by not wanting to tell the truth. And then a few weeks later after telling the truth, the illness was completely gone. So that just shows you the power that the body has to reflect the, the soul's denial of an emotion. Now, does anyone else want to share? Um, Cody, do you want to come up as well? No, no. it's okay. no worries. Um, I'm shaking all over and inside with the fear I had about coming up here and saying this, but I, it's been on my, or in my heart for quite a few months now that my son Cody, he really uh, is an angry person and I know that that anger is inside me and uh, he's only reflecting that. The, the realisation, the realisation that I have about that anger comes from myself, my father, and I know that without wanting to really admit it, it does come from God as well. Uh, it, it's when I go into my side of it, there's a lot of decisions that I feel that I've made in my life that hasn't turned out the way I thought they would have, and in a way uh, reflected on my looking at what I could do with my children and my relationship with my wife. Uh, it it, it um, sort of reflects back to, after listening to AJ and the tapes after uh, this seven months now, that I know I have been very, very angry with my father all my life because I've been missed, uh, left out on a lot of things. Uh, he was an alcoholic up to 15 years ago, but now he's constantly on morphine because he's got a bad back problem. So he believes that he's got over it, but I've never felt that and I've never been able to really, in my heart, forgive him, even though mentally I've tried so many times and I've been to self-development courses and come back and explain to him and how I feel about it and ask for his forgiveness, but I'm now realising that it's not 
him that needs to forgive me, it's, it's myself. And also, the only way that's going to happen is by feeling it. I've been like a volcano for the last three months or so, waiting for this anger to explode. And I have a fear inside me that I don't, I don't trust how I'm going to react to that. That's one reason why it's not happening. And the other one is a fear about what I'm going to be judged by other people when that does happen. Um, I'm still shaking with fear of just having this experience of talking in front of a crowd before I've never done that before. So it's um, not to so many people. Um, uh, going back to the anger I have with my father, um, is a lot that he put on to my mother. And also realized that my father wasn't a good father. And I never really acknowledged that he was a good father. I always thought that he could have done a lot better, uh, leaving me out. And most times he always promised a lot of things to me when I was a child and I'd wait up all night anticipation waiting for that to happen the next day. And I couldn't very rarely slept those nights because I was so anxious to be able to spend some time with my father. And um, it never happened. He always found an excuse of, of letting me down or, or why we couldn't happen. But on occasions he would take me. And that brought out a lot of fear because every time he did take me, he was blind drunk and we'd go out to seas that are 35 knot winds or you know, really, really bad places for a, a little child to be in. But he felt that that was fun, that was good and he kept reminding me that he did do you know, take me places. But I've never actually understood or acknowledged that to myself until now, uh, until listening to Soul the other little girl, um, you know, to, to really face how I feel um, with, with, that's inside myself. So I thank them from the bottom of my heart about that, to, to, be, able to, uh, to be able to be open up by a child. And the, the strength that I have is I don't want to... <laughs> I don't want to continue on with um, this anger inside me. I know that that's not me. I yeah. truly know that deep down that's not who I really am. And I don't want that for my kids. I've already you know, talked to them and, and cried with both my younger children about this anger and, and being a bad father. But I still knew that I didn't tap into that, that real deep anger that I have. And I also have, um, I always thought my mum, I was very, always, still am very close to my mother. And I always thought that I really, truly loved her, but a fortnight ago I realised that I didn't love my mother like I thought I did as well. And the biggest problem with, that I found or I felt from her was that she overcloaked me all the time. She I was her special son, it was her first child. And, uh, um, just, just by not being able to express how I really felt as a child, I became shy, and I, I, I always thought that was my personality, but now I realise that it's not. It's what my, my mother actually put over me, or made me believe that I was that. And I was a very, Chris, I got into a lot of trouble when I was a child. I used to go and hide, sleep in cane paddocks, and they would be able to, uh, burn for hours because they'd have to find me first and scared of where I would be or to get burned in the cane paddock or I always was lucky that I had someone watching over me and in my life it was dogs they used to always help me or bring me home or made my parents aware of where I was at that time so I was very fortunate in, in those sort of regards otherwise I probably wouldn't be here today um, but yeah going back to my, my children I know my son is a little bit um, shy and, and embarrassed about his dad speaking. Um, and he's the main reason why I'm up here speaking about this and where I feel inside. Um, so can I interrupt you now? Yes, you can. Um, 
the anger that you feel. And yeah. firstly, can you let everyone know your name? Because you didn't. Oh, uh, my name's Brett Porter, and my son Cody. And Brett, where's Brett from? I'm um, from in North Queensland. Brett's travelled quite a few thousand days <laughs> to come here. And um, yeah, Brett, the first thing we regarding your anger. The reason why you're getting into anger all the time is because there's a lot of childhood sadness that you don't want to let yourself feel. And you'd rather feel anger than sad. So one thing you need to do is pray to God about this issue of why you feel like anger is preferable. And you'll find that there's a lot of things to do with feeling powerless if you cry. Yeah, yeah I, I can relate to that. Yeah. Yeah. So what, what's going to help you get through this anger yourself is to actually start seeing that you want to feel powerful rather than feel the powerlessness of crime. Does that make sense to you? Yeah, yes it does. Yeah. So, so rather than choosing to be powerful, you can make a different choice and the choice is to be powerless. But you'll become almost addicted to the powerful emotion. Does that make sense? You know how the previous lady was addicted to the notion of self-blame? Yes. You'll become addicted to the anger. So if you can see your anger like a cigarette that you're reaching for every time that you feel sad inside of yourself. So every moment that you're angry, tell yourself this, I am sad and I don't want to feel it. I am sad and I don't want to feel it. Yeah because it's the choice that you're making to not feel your sadness that creates your anger. Now, your, your son gets angry for the same reason. He is, he's, he's reflecting your choice to actually not feel your sadness. You will find when you start feeling your sadness properly, right, his anger will also subside. Yeah, I, I, yeah, I, I sort of had that feeling that that was the case. Yeah. Because um, I, I, I do feel sad about a lot of things. Yeah. Now you, you have actually identified in, in, this, uh, in this discussion, you've already identified what you're sad about. But you're not letting yourself cry about it. You almost, you got pretty close then, and you, there's a few tears run down. But what you're going to need to do now is actually tune into those feelings that you have about why and really just let it flow. Make the choice to let that emotion flow rather than going back into a powerful state or a feeling of power. So just very well, anger is your choice to feel powerful. Does everyone understand what I mean by that? Now when you get angry, it is actually the indication that you are denying a deeper emotion. So ask yourself, what is the underlying emotion? And allow yourself to go to the underlying emotion. If you don't go to the underlying emotion, you will keep on going to this emotion of wanting power. And, and that emotion, wanting to feel powerful, is what causes so much damage to yourself and everyone else around you. So does that make sense? Yeah, so it's sort of relating to um, the sadness about being left out and not being wanted and not being loved. Yeah, you've yeah. actually also identified some sadnesses with your mother and your father. Uh, yes, yes. Your mother you felt oppressed by. Yeah. Like, you felt like you had to be a good boy all the time oh, Yes. with your mother. And then with your father, you know, you were constantly looking for his approval and wanting time with him and everything and he never gave it to you. And there's some really, really deep core emotions about that in you that you're sad about. And allow yourself to go there. At the moment what's happening is you're not allowing yourself to go into that childlike state to okay. actually feel that emotion. Yes, yes it does. Yes. Yes, it's, yes, it's, I've sort of felt that that's been the case, but not able to be able to acknowledge it and to allow it to actually feel it. Yeah. So the, the key thing right now is to every time you feel angry to acknowledge that I'm denying my sadness. Yeah, just... Every single time you feel angry, that's what's happening. I'm denying my sadness. And this particular situation, whatever the external situation is that triggered your anger, 
is just a trigger of the sadness as well. There's something that's sad about it, that you're finding sad about it. Does that make sense? And what you're doing is you're avoiding the sadness of it and going into anger instead. Well, it's, it's an automatic process that this the anger's there as a block and I'm just going along with that because that feels that's a normal way I've actually progressed in my life. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. So actually acknowledging that I need to use that as a tool to recognise the sadness that I have. Yes. Yeah. Right. So in, a, in about a month and a half's time I'll be doing a discussion on anger. And uh, in that discussion, that's one of the things I will actually be saying about anger being the choice that we make to get away from that powerless emotion. So uh, with that discussion, whether you're present or not, if you can grab one of the DVDs of that discussion, if you haven't dealt with the emotion by then, you'll find that discussion will help quite well. Yeah, all right, thank you very much. No worries. So, so really, do you want to start? Yeah, we'll start. Yeah. Um, so really this issue with sadness and anger, anger is actually the result of the fear of your sadness. Does that make sense to everyone? So every time you get angry, you are actually afraid of feeling a deeper emotion. It's a fear of an even deeper emotion. Allow yourself to feel it. That's the key thing, allow yourself to feel it. And anyone else want to add? Ray, you want to come up and then we'll...
So that's what I noticed. Did Michael, do you want to say anything about that? What do you feel when Mark feels sad? Um, I feel like cheering him up, yeah. helping her and supporting her with whatever is going on. Yeah. Um, yeah, I just felt, you know, she doesn't get, she doesn't go out much, and I just wanted to please her to go out too, and just, you know, listen to what she's listening to, and try and sort of like put that into my life as well. So. So in a lot of ways, you're trying to make mum feel better, aren't you? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So, so actually, mum's addiction is you making her feel better. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah. Yes. And so what, what, the reason why mum, that's mum's addiction is because she doesn't want to feel as bad as she feels when it comes to men. And that's related to, of course, as you will quickly in a your relationship with your father. Does that make sense? Yeah. So, now, what do, what do we do with addictions? Well, there's a few ways we can stop addictions. One way, uh, if you were smoking, there's a, there's a method called cold turkey, you've heard of that, right? <laughs> Which means just stop doing it and see what happens after that and deal with it. So one thing you could try to do, and this is, this is something that would be trying, so it's not what I'd recommend in the end anyway, but one thing you could do is just every time you feel bad, and you notice that your son Michael comes to you trying to cheer you up. You say to Michael, ah, oh, you're trying to cheer me up again. That means I'm denying an emotion. Does that make sense? Yeah. And I'm denying an emotion because Michael's a male, you're denying an emotion of what you want from a male. So what, you, what you're projecting out is, I want a hug from a male, I want a hug from a male. So you know, it comes up, gives you a hug. Or, yeah, oh, he's been, oh, doing a bit, been doing that a bit just lately, actually. Yeah. yeah. Or, or, you know, I want to feel good uh, for the male. I need to, you know, I don't have any male in my life, which is the thing you mentioned right, right, right at the beginning. So now Michael's going to be that male in, the, in your life for you. That doesn't seem fair. Well, it's not, actually. Now, he feels good doing it sometimes, don't you, Michael? Yeah. And sometimes you don't feel that good doing it either, really, sometimes. No, sometimes. <laughs> sometimes it feels a bit like a drag, doesn't it? Like, you need to have some of your own life. So, so this is the issue, is that when, when we do that as a mother towards our son, or as a father, by the way, many fathers do this towards their daughters as well. So when we do that, we set up this dynamic where now he is going to, he, he is now going to have this role with women, this role of looking after a woman. Now that's going to be quite damaging for him later in his life because he's going to attract a woman who needs looking after. And then he'll look after her and he'll feel that's love. So it's really important that you break this cycle now with, with your own feelings. So what are you going to do? You've heard all the yeah, I know, I know I'm really good. Yeah. <laughs> I get really mixed up when it comes to me. Okay, <laughs> as do we all. <laughs> what are you going to do then? Um, what do you well, think is the best thing? Well, what you suggested, I, I, I like that, uh, recognising when Michael's coming up and giving me a hug, to recognise that I'm going through some sad, uh, sadness or some um, pain associated with uh, feeling... Um, Can I correct you, though? Because you're not going through it. That's the problem. That's why you're coming up. But that's why you're saying it, yeah. yeah. So he, he's actually coming up to give you the hug because you're not choosing to actually feel the emotion. Yeah. You're projecting around to all the men around you Give me, a, give me a hug, rescue me. And he's the closest man around you that comes up and rescues you. Oh, actually, he's the only one that I probably exactly, trust. Exactly, <laughs> exactly. So he does that. Yeah. So what it actually means is you're shutting down the emotion. See, he won't feel like he needs to do that when you own it. See, what, often what we do is we, we start feeling the emotion. So, you know, I start feeling like I've got no male in my life, right? So I start feeling that. And I don't want to go to the core of it, which is about my relationship with my dad. Mm. So I'm choosing to not go to the core. And in the choice, that particular choice, as soon as I make that choice, the projection of my son is going to be, you need to fix this for me. You're not thinking it in your head. 
that that's what he's feeling from you, that you need to fix this for him. Does that make sense? And yes, it does. Although, although I, I feel like I have been doing a fair bit of work on it, obviously not enough. Well, no, what you're actually doing is you're feeling the effect emotions, which, but not the core emotion. And you do want him to come and give you a hug, actually. That's one of your addictions. But that's okay, isn't it? Now no, then? no, it's not. Can't you ever give me a hug? No, not, not under these circumstances, oh. no. Now, now, can everyone see why? My, if my addiction is, when I get this hug, I feel better as a woman in my relationships with a man, right? When I get this hug. This hug's coming from my son, right? And I'm feeling better as a woman because, you know, if he's showing me love and he's a male and I'm getting love from a male, right? The problem is, is all that does is feed the addiction. It's like going and getting a shot. You know, if you're a drug addiction, uh, if you're a drug addict, going and get your shot. And that's all it does for you. It actually keeps you out of the emotion. That's what it does for you. So would it be helpful um, to say to Michael, well, Michael, just recognise whenever you want to give me a hug, just say, Mum, you're just, you're no, loving your emotion. No, see what you're doing now? You're actually putting the onus on Michael <laughs> to cure your problem. That's no good. Right. So okay. why, why do you want to do that? Oh, it's just a band-aid job, I guess. Exactly. And why do you want to do that? Because I you do. Don't. Yeah, I guess I don't. But I've, I actually have been trying to get into these emotions to do with my dad. Yeah. And um. But let's be honest with them. You don't want to do it. You've been trying to do it, but your feeling inside is it's pretty scary, and I don't know if I can do this. That's the real feeling inside of you. Does that make sense? You feel pretty frightened about dealing with this stuff about the dad. So the first thing you need to do is acknowledge that. I'm really frightened about this stuff about my dad. I'm really frightened about how much it's influenced my life. I'm really yeah, frightened, I'm really about, frightened about, about how it's influenced my children's lives. Yep, yep. yep. <laughs> because they're already grown up women, the other three, like being whole. That's pretty heavy. So, but see, now you're entering into self-punishment mode, and we're getting out of the real core emotion again. The emotion is about your dad. Yep. Right. So, can you see how easy it is just to get out of this, to get out of these core emotions and straight back into the blaming emotions? Straight back into them. We're doing this all the time. There's a lot of self-judgment happening. This is why many of you are feeling quite stuck with processing emotions, because what's happening is it. You're getting back out of the core emotion and into these self-blame emotions or into self-punishment emotions or wanting the addiction satisfied, which actually keeps you away from the core emotion. So, so in this particular example, Michael comes to you to give a hug. If you actually say to him, don't give me the hug, you're actually lying to yourself. Because the feeling that came from you to Michael before then was to give me a hug. Does that make sense? So, so you would actually be lying to yourself to say to Michael, don't give me a hug, because the feeling from coming from you is give me a hug. Yeah. You follow me? Yeah. So you, when he comes to give you a hug, you have to acknowledge the fact, I wanted him to give me a hug. That's my little attraction, see? Yeah. I wanted him to give me a hug, and that's my addiction. Just admit that to yourself. Right. I wanted this hug, that's my addiction. Right. Why did I want him to hug me right now? What was I feeling just the instant before I wanted him to hug me? What was the feeling that I had that I'm trying to get away from? Ask yourself that. And you'll find in every case it's, it's a feeling about men that you were feeling and a feeling of being unloved as a woman from a man. You actually have quite good relationships with women generally. Right? Better than you do with men. Yes. Okay. So, so obviously the, the bigger addiction is going to be towards the male, and hence that's why, even though they're twins, Michael is the one responding. Does that make sense? Yes. Yeah. yes. Yeah. So every time he comes to give you a hug, acknowledge, I wanted this hug from him. It would be wrong of me to actually say, don't give me a hug, Mark, because actually the feeling was I wanted him to give me one. And then acknowledge, I wanted him to give me a hug because I was feeling 
what was the feeling? Insecure, unsafe, whatever the feeling was that you were trying to avoid. Now that's the emotion that is the core emotion that you need to let yourself get into. If that makes sense? It'll be really rapid if you see the trigger. It'll be really rapid for you to see the emotion if you can look at what's going on the instant he does what he does. Mm. And the way you can help mum, and you don't have to by the way, because that's your call, the way you can help mum is to only hug her when you feel like she doesn't want one. <laughs> Kind of right. to think about that. <laughs> All right. So, because um, whenever she wants one, actually, what you're doing is coming and actually helping her addiction. But it's not, but but I must point out, it is not Michael's responsibility to solve this problem. It is the parents' responsibility to solve this problem. Mm. Can I point out that because for Michael, what he's learning is. The way I get love from a woman is if I suppress my own desires and put theirs before mine, then I get all these lovely feelings from a woman. And so then that must be love. If I do that for a woman, that's what loving is in a relationship because that's what he's learning with his mum. But once you clear your emotions, it might be strange for him as well because he's got this addiction of if I make mum feel better, then I feel loved. So you're not going to be asking for him to make you feel better all the time either. But, like, yeah, yeah. So, yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. But really, after that, when you're not carrying that big injury around, you will have hugs with your son. It just won't be based on this need. need. So, that, so one emotion that you may feel, Michael, when Mum's going through this is you might feel like she doesn't want a hug from you anymore, and you might feel that you might feel unloved then. Does that make sense? Because you're so used to giving it. Yeah. Yeah. And if you feel that, and just let yourself feel that, and work through that issue, because it, this will impact a lot on your relationships with girls. So, so you, you don't want to keep getting girlfriends that you've got to look after the rest of your life. Right? <laughs> you don't want to do that. You want to get a girl who you've got a good relationship with, and you can get along together with without having to look after her all the time, right? And, uh, and that would be not a good, a good relationship. So that, so it, it's very good if you can work through this issue. You find Michael be able to work through that issue very rapidly. Yeah. Okay. So remember, it's about your dad yeah. and feelings of uns lack of safety, lack of security, lack of um, you know, not being loved from a male, those kind of feelings. Every time, notice your behaviour, notice his behaviour as your law of attraction. Yeah. Remember yesterday in that talk we said, that our children's behaviour is our law of attraction. Yeah. Yes. Not, not theirs not so much, it's ours. Yes. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Okay. Does that help any? Um, okay. You have a it's question? The hard bit actually is yeah. just getting into and recognising that and going and dealing with it, I suppose. That's, yes. That, yeah. At the moment, there is a strong desire in you to not deal with the underlying you're afraid. So while you're intellectually telling yourself, I must do it, I must do it for the sake of my children, I must do it in particular for the sake of myself, I must do it for, for my own self, there's a feeling inside of you of fear about doing it. And if you can acknowledge those fears, it will help you a lot. In fact, uh, this is where the fear list that I mentioned earlier is very handy, writing a list of all the fears about your relationships with men. Not just what you're afraid of from men, but what you're afraid of not getting from men. Mm -hmm. And let yourself deal with those, because underneath those are the causal emotions that you feel with your father that need to be healed. But if you can at least acknowledge every single time he comes to support you, many times it's driven by an emotion inside of you that you want his support. Mm. Little question though now that the Michael's got in his mind that only to give me a hug when he feels like I don't need it. It's still going to be a law of attraction though, isn't it? You, you are going to, because of the addiction, you are going to project at Michael, I want a hug. Right? And if he doesn't give it to you, there's a high likelihood you're going to get angry in your current condition. Okay. So that's something you've got to be very careful of. So that would be another thing I need to be aware of. Yeah. If I get angry then, then with Michael. With Michael then there's an issue here of you not feeling loved by a man now. Does mm -hmm. that make sense? Yeah. And it's a denial of the lower emotion of not wanting, like, you, 
before CP stops doing the addiction, you might finish up getting angry with him, right? Because you still want the addiction. Yeah. So you, what, what happens to a smoker when you take away your cigarettes for a day? <laughs> what happens to a smoker? They get pretty Like they didn't want to give up cigarettes and you take away their cigarettes for a day. Yeah. And that's what my, if, if Michael decided, no, today I'm not going to do what mum wants from me, I'm only going to do what I feel what I want to do for mum, that's going to trigger you quite a lot if you decided to do that. Oh. And if you feel anger towards Michael, that's another <laughs> suggestion, I'm just denying my own emotion here. Mm. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah. good. Yeah, if you just acknowledge those things, it'll help you get to the underlying emotion. All right. Yeah. yeah thank you. No worries. Yeah. Thanks, Michael, too, for your comments. Right. Does anyone? Oh, do us. Yeah. Michael, want to start, too? Or you're too grown up for this kind of stuff? <laughs> too grown up. No worries. He's too cool for that. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
I'd get about you know, two centimetres below the surface and then I'd shut myself down. Do you feel it is a bit scary to feel an angry baby? Yeah, that, and I, I also don't know how to. Because a lot of it's probably from when you're very small. Mm. So maybe doing some things like when you, how you would express anger when you're really small, throwing things, bashing things, stamping, kicking. So have you got a place where you could do that? Yeah. Yeah. Good. So there's a bit of a bush block or something happening somewhere. Good. So what, what I'll do is create a little corner of that location and that's going to be your angry place. And what you do is get a heap of rocks and a heap of glass and a heap of like other things you can bash and make noises about and throw and whatever. And you just, every time you're angry, you just run down there and just yell and scream and throw until the anger's gone. And let yourself go even deeper than the anger after that. So once you've done that, you've thrown all that stuff around, now starts going into the sadness of it. Like, does that make sense? So allow yourself to get into the sadness if you're expressing it. So when you get into the anger, feel the anger. The problem with anger is you could stay in it the rest of your life. So you don't want to do that either. Right? You don't want to use anger as an addiction, just like you know, we use drugs as an addiction before. So but we want to actually express the anger because it's been suppressed. So it needs to be experienced and felt. So let yourself feel it and let yourself go to that little place in, the, in, your, in your yard or whatever and just let yourself experience it completely. But also ask yourself what you're afraid of every time you're angry. And then write about that when you come out of that anger. Does that make sense? And what will happen is when you write about it, you will start acknowledging and opening up parts of your soul that are holding the grief. And there's quite a bit of grief to feel. Oh, yeah. yeah. I feel like you're going to the feeling. Yeah. And I'm allowed to stab my parents. <laughs> are you allowed to stab yeah, my parents? Really well, <laughs> what you do is you make a cardboard cut out of your parents. Right? And do it that way. But don't stab your parents, no. You, you'll get into trouble with that, you know that. <laughs> you'll get into trouble with God then, and also. But if you've got the emotion in you, where you really feel you'd like to stab them, to let to express that in a safe way, it's got to be done. Yeah. You know. But involve, how do you feel about God now? Um, I thought I was fine, but... I realised just a, a little while ago that the growing up in, in that cult, and then, you know, I found out it, well, it, it never felt right. Yeah. So it, you know, I guess I had trust issues with God because God wasn't in that supposed religion. Yeah, yeah. yeah. You certainly will have some trust issues with God. And, and, and again, if you can express them to God, because God can handle anything you can throw at Him. So when you feel angry with God, express it directly to God. When you're still sad about God not being around for you during this cult thing, express that to God too. So this is part of this is about opening up to God. You find that when you do open up to God, you'll be able to also express your emotions a lot more too. Yeah. At the moment, there's just a big fear in you that that there's this. You, the fear is that there's this huge mess inside and you'll never get to the bottom of it. Yeah. But, the truth is that you will get to the bottom of it quite rapidly when you let yourself feel the fear that you feel about it. Because actually, what I can feel and you and Mary can feel it too, is you have the capacity of experiencing your emotions quite well. I also have the capacity to shut myself down really well. Well, everyone who has the capacity to experience quite well generally also has a good capacity to shut down quite well too. But that, that's been a problem. I'll, go, I'll start to feel and then bang, no, I can't go there. Mm -hmm. So when you say, I can't go there, straight away, like, write about why you can't go there. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Let yourself feel about why you can't go there. It, and I said this today to, to everyone that this process is a lot about undoing the blockages to feelings. You actually have a very sensitive soul and you will actually feel very well once you start. The 
problem is is just undoing the blockages that have been placed there by your parents and, and you know this abusive environment that you lived in. Does that make sense? And it's the key is just allow yourself to keep plugging away at these blockages and seeing what the fears are and then allowing yourself, and one of those blockages is not allowing yourself to feel anger, as Mary pointed out. So allow yourself to experience the anger and you will find you 